Welcome back from spring break. I hope everybody had a fun, safe time. Uh, maybe somebody got to go to the beach or something. Um, either way, hope you enjoyed your week away. Can you believe that we are almost to the end of the semester? Including this week, there are only four weeks left. There's this lecture, a lecture about the 60s, and then a lecture about the 70s, and that's final exam time. I mean, this semester is blown by. This week is also pretty cool because you get to watch some TV shows. For your discussion this week, you have to watch a couple episodes of a TV show called Leave it to Beaver and a couple episodes of a TV show called I Love Lucy. Both of those links are in the discussion, so make sure you click Chapter 26 Discussion, start a thread, and then get to watching. Well, this is called The Affluent Society, The Search for Consensus and Conformity. Really, this is a lecture about the 1950s and how America changes after World War II ends. So I'm going to start with what's called the affluent economy. And you have to understand that after World War II, there was a fear that a depression was going to happen, just like after World War I. But it, it's completely just unfounded fear. The next 25 years of American history are the most fruitful in American history, the most prosperous in American history. A lot of it comes down to something called the GI Bill. The GI Bill is going to stimulate the American economy and it provides money for veterans to get a college education. It provides money for veterans to get medical help and medical needs taken care of. And it provides money for veterans to get loans for homes. America's also helped with the Marshall Plan. I mentioned that with the, with the uh, Cold War. But you have to remember that the United States is basically going to be rebuilding Europe. And that brings money into the United States also. But then there's something that you don't know much about that really affects our everyday life, and that's called the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944. And at the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, that's what set the dollar as the world's economy, or I should say currency, in the world economy. Prior to the dollar, it was the British pound, but during 1944, you know, Europe is weak because of World War II, and America hasn't really been touched. So the American dollar becomes the world currency and still is today. Another big deal during the war is with savings. During the war, Americans couldn't spend money on anything. There's no such thing as a 1941 car. There's no such thing as a 1942 car. Um, production on any luxury items stopped. After the war's over, Americans, they have tons of money to spend since the war's over. By the end of 1959, 60% of Americans own a home and 75% own a car. There's also a big boom with post-war industry. Uh, during the 1950s, the government keeps spending a ton of money and over half of the money spent in the 1950s goes to the military and that's an outgrowth of the Cold War. Both the government and private corporations are going to spend a lot of money during the 50s on research. And a lot of things we take for granted today were invented in the 1940s or 1950s. Some examples are synthetic fibers like rayon, um, toasters, radios, TVs, air conditioners. Um, all of these new appliances, they're going to cause electrical use to triple, which, you know, causes an increase in pollution because of oil usage. Oil was cheap, uh, cars get big, gas is cheap, factories are not fuel efficient at all. You also have the birth of the computers. Uh, the first computer is created for the army in the mid 1940s and it was called the ENIAC and the ENIAC computer was the size of an entire room and all it did was measured out the shooting trajectory of artillery so that the artillery could hit the enemy. Moving on from there, in 1948, a company called Bell Labs, which was part of the original AT&T that no longer exists, invented transistors. Now, if you've ever taken apart a 
in electronic, you're going to see these little uh, things that are attached to the green circuit board. Those are transistors. They're meant as on-off switches to transmit electricity through the board. And as those transistors got smaller and smaller and smaller, that meant that technology and computers could get smaller and smaller and smaller. By the way, the picture of the ENIAC there at the bottom right corner, that is just one segment of the ENIAC machine. When they tore it apart, they gave it to multiple museums because it was so big. In the early 1950s, a company called International Business Machines, better known as IBM today, switched from building adding machines to building computers. And IBM today is one of the largest corporations in the world, and by the 1960s, the computer industry is a billion dollar industry. Uh, computers are everywhere by the 1960s. They're in the government, they're in schools, they're even being used in hospitals. Post-war business. Uh, the easiest way to say this is that big business gets even bigger. Technology allows corporations to get huge. Uh, by 1960, the largest 0.5% of all corporations in this country are making over half the money. And if there's one word to explain big business, that's oligopoly. Uh, you find this in auto industries. In fact, today there's only a couple of auto makers. You find this in the chemical industry. You find this in the tobacco industry, the beer industry, the soft drink in industry. Uh, eventually, it's going to go on to the fast food industry. America also goes corporate during the 1950s. Uh, we have corporate boards now instead of indis um, rich individuals. And a lot of that has to do with this idea, this concept of a guy named William White. He wrote a book in 1956 called The Organization Man. And in The Organization Man, William White is going to say a good executive is no longer a free thinker, but he is instead someone who gets along and works well in a team. So basically, no more individuals. The individual is not what's important. It's the idea of team. Another book called The Lonely Crowd by David Reisman is going to say that good executives are worried about corporate success more than they're worried about individual success. It's the good of the corporation over your own individual profit. And The Lonely Crowd is where we actually get the idea of the business suit man wearing the gray suit, the hat, the, the um, briefcase. Today's idea of a businessman is a creation of David Reisman and the Lonely Crowd. Beyond that, even farms go corporate. Uh, big farm owners are going to be using corporate seeds, corporate fertilizer. Uh, today, a lot of people don't know this, but seeds are actually patented. Uh, DeKalb and Monsanto and a couple other companies, they actually own the seeds and farmers have to buy seeds from those particular companies. Uh, not only that, but they have to usually advertise those companies too. A great example, if you've ever been to the Midwest and you've driven down old farm roads, you're going to see signs on the sides of, of roads with their particular seed dealer's name on them. You also have to look at pollution and you have to look at labor unions too. Uh, first of all, there's lots of pollution in the 1950s because of the inefficient use of oil. Uh, most Americans don't care until Rachel Carson writes a book called Silent Spring. And Silent Spring is all about researching DDT and other pesticides and their effects on the environment and their effects on nature. So Rachel Carson is the first one to say, hey, uh, the use of DDT is causing the eggshells of bald eagles to get thinner and thinner and thinner. Rachel Carson also makes people aware that DDT is causing the eggshells of California condors to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And eventually it's even linked to um, like 
birth defects and everything else. Because of Rachel Carson in the book Silent Spring, the government actually bans the use of DDT. When it comes to labor unions, labor unions are actually going to get smaller. For example, the AFL and CIO, which were the two largest unions, they're going to merge together. And the big reason labor unions weaken is because of all the, quote, perks that are given by employers. Perks that we take for granted today, like sick time, vacation time, insurance, stonks, you name it. And the number of union members actually drops because the number of blue collar or manufacturing jobs decrease and the number of white collar or management jobs increases. And that has to do with corporations getting bigger and the idea of the corporate board taking over. Now part two of this is called the affluent society. How does all of this affect everyday people? First of all, consumerism. So much consumerism. The 1950s really is the birth of mo the modern American consumer. I mean, you get credit cards. Everybody has credit cards by the end of the 1950s, and the first credit card wasn't even invented until the year 1950 when the Diners Club card was created. By the end of the 1950s, there are over 58 million cars on the road. And guess what follows with that? You get accidents, fatalities, pollution, traffic jams, and people moving from the cities into the suburbs. William Levitt is going to invent the modern suburb, the modern suburban neighborhood, if you will. If you've ever seen or maybe you live in a neighborhood where there's only two or three types of houses and the type of house varies like house one, house two, house three, and then house one, house two, house three, and they're all close together. Well, that is an invention of William Levitt. You can see here a picture of a South or I should say Southern California Levitt town and the first quote modern suburban neighborhoods are built in 1947. Who are they built for? Veterans, because veterans are getting money from the GI Bill to buy houses. When you really look at it, the government is going to subsidize this rise of suburbia. Uh, the government gives money to the auto industry, people buy more cars. Then there are more cars, so the government builds highways and eventually they build the interstate system and then the people move and wherever the people move the government is going to encourage corporations and give loans to those businesses to move wherever the people have gone so the 1950s it's going to end up being a land of fast food drive-in theaters everybody goes shopping in fact people believe it or not would go from Havana Cuba to Miami Florida just for the day to go shopping at the mall and vice versa. Now there are some groups of people who are more affected by this consumerism than others. For example, this is the era of the baby boom. Baby boom, depending on who you're talking to, the numbers can be a little different, but I'm putting it 1945 to 1950. Uh, there are 21 million babies born in that five-year period, and by 1960, one out of every three Americans is under the age of 14. There are children running around everywhere by 1960. People move from the Northeast to the South, and people move from the South from the Northeast to the West because air conditioning makes both of those regions regions of the country more palatable would that be the word uh, more comfortable maybe that's what i should say now all of the people leaving the inner cities and going to suburbia that's mostly a white movement african americans they're going to be left in the inner cities mostly because 
they can't afford to move. They don't have the jobs, they don't have the income equality, they don't even get qualified for the loans. And so poor blacks and African Americans are left mostly in the inner city while white flight, as it was called, occurs in the suburbs. Now it's not just a population increase from the number of children being born. There are also medical advances that were created or researched during World War II that lead to a reduction in childhood death rates, longer life expectancy. Uh, medical equipment has come a long way by the 1950s. Um, modern medicine and antibiotics are curing a lot of infections. Another big change with consumerism is that those who are poor end up getting poorer. By 1960, one out of every five Americans are below the poverty line, and that is one out of every two elders or senior citizens, one out of every three people living in a rural setting, and then of course the inner cities are very low income as well. Now, there's this culture that develops in the 1950s where everybody has to fit this American mold. And if you watch any TV show from the 1950s, you're going to see many of the same things, like men wearing suits, women wearing dresses, uh, short hair slicked back. Everybody's going to attend church. Everybody's religious. Uh, under God is added to both the currency and the pledge. Religious movies get big. Uh, church attendance starts to grow. Um, this is the birth of Charleston Heston and the Ten Commandments, Charleston Heston and Ben Hur, uh, the greatest story ever told. Um, you've also got Billy Graham, who just recently died. He gets a start in the 1950s. Um, and Hollywood has some of the biggest movie stars ever. Cary Grant, Humphrey Bogart, Grace Kelly, uh, Charleston Heston, as I mentioned, Audrey Hepburn. I mean, Humphrey Bogart, he was in uh, Casablanca, one of the best movies of all time. Charleston Heston was in Ben-Hur and the Ten Commandments. Audrey Hepburn was in just about everything. Uh, Grace Kelly is supposed to be one of the most beautiful actresses to ever live. Uh, but the interesting thing is, even though Hollywood has all the huge stars, television is going to take a chunk out of movie attendance. Um, by the 1960s, nine out of every 10 homes have a TV. And believe it or not, this will be a, a test question, so be listening. The TV Guide. Of all magazines, the TV Guide is the number one magazine in America. That's just hard to believe. An interesting piece of this culture change is that school attendance goes way up. Now, during the Great Depression, people didn't get to go to school. And during World War II, people didn't get to go to school. So you have multiple generations going to school to get degrees. At school, everybody is taught to fit into this American mold. And the generation of the 1950s is often known as the silent generation because they just kind of fit in. They don't stand out. Uh, that's not to say everybody was the same because you do have people such as like the greasers, if you've ever read the outsiders in, in English. There is a group that stands out, but most people, conservative dress, religious, suits, short hair, very polite, very leave it to beaver-esque. Now, Everybody, for the most part, sees the Soviet Union as evil. This is the high point of the Cold War. The launch of Sputnik, as I mentioned last time, was the worst thing ever. And if you didn't fit the American mold, the short hair, conservative dress, the religious look, you were suspected of being a communist. Now, there's going to be this youthful rebellion. There's going to be this underground movement called rock and roll. 
rock and roll was considered evil and vulgar and, and X-rated, R-rated. Elvis is seen as vulgar because of the moves he makes when he dances. His nickname was Elvis the Pelvis because he couldn't stay still. And Elvis, for a little while, could not be filmed from the waist down because of his movements being seen as distasteful. And then James Dean is seen as evil because he's got slicked back hair, he's wearing the white t-shirt and the the jacket made out of leather and he is like the anti-conservative dress. Check out this movement here. It's moving forward here. I don't know if you can actually hear this. If you can't, listen to it through the PowerPoint. But you'll see here the movements that got Elvis in trouble. These dance moves were considered vulgar. Well, that's all I have for today. Uh, just a real quick look at your your calendar here. We're right here. All of this work is due by April 19th. Then we have a lecture next week and work due on the 26th. And we have one, less, one last lecture after that. Notice on May 3rd, last day of class before we have the final exam, both your fourth reflection paper and your SLO essay are due. So make sure you are working on that SLO essay and make sure you watch for my video on the SLO essay to give you some pointers, some tips, and some help. All right, until next time, I know this one was fairly short, but uh, we'll ease you back into to full-blown lectures for next week. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.